All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This will be our last video in chapter 13, uh, where we're talking about experiments and observational studies. In the previous videos, we've talked about the four pillars of experimental design, and we've gone through an example of how to do kind of a basic experiment. Um, in this video, we're going to go through a, just a bunch of details, right? There's a lot of uh, little things that we need to talk about in terms of uh, how we run an experiment or um, maybe how we add additional factors or that kind of thing. So we're going to kind of we're going to hit on a lot of different sort of vocabulary and ideas in this video. All right. So uh, starting here, experiments and samples. To, to the difference between what we're doing in this chapter versus chapter 12. So experiments and sample surveys, we're both using randomization to get unbiased data, uh, but we do so in different ways and for different purposes. So the thing that we did in chapter 12, sample surveys. We're trying to estimate something from a population, right? Remember, we had like a big population, and then we needed to find out, uh, you know, who's going to vote for who. And so we found a sample survey, uh, excuse me, a sampling frame of that uh, population that we would gather from. And then we took a sample from that uh, particular uh, sampling frame. So that allowed us to get a representative sample of the population so that we could determine some parameter or statistic, all right? Experiments are different. Experiments are trying to assess the effects of a treatment, right? We're trying to decide, does this manipulating variable have an effect on the response variable? And uh, we're not randomly drawing units from a population, right? Uh, you do these kind of experiments in like drug trials. So if we're doing a drug trial to help us uh, cure cancer, we're not gonna gather a random group of people from the population because you need people with cancer, right? So you gather a group of people with cancer and then you use randomization to put them into treatment groups. So we're using randomization but we are using randomization differently in an experiment than we are in a sample survey. Uh, we use, uh, we also use things called control treatments, uh, and they always give you kind of a baseline. We want to compare, uh, when we want to compare a treatment with uh, basically no treatment. So if you think back to the tomato experiment we did on the previous video, um, we had the tomatoes, we're going to call that Tom, then we had three different treatments, and one of those treatments was no fertilizer. It was, we're just going to grow tomatoes regular, okay? This right here is called a control, and uh, it's called a control or a control group because we're using it as like a baseline comparison. If we don't apply the treatment in any way, uh, how does that have, does that have an effect? Okay. So in the tomatoes, it was this, uh, a lot of times in, uh, when you're doing like drug trials, we'll have what's called, uh, the, uh, oh, excuse me, we'll have what's called a placebo group. Uh, and we'll talk about placebos in just a minute. And, uh, in that group, the, the people will receive like a sugar pill. It'll be a pill that they have to take. Uh, but it'll just be a sugar pill. It won't actually have the medicine inside of it uh, to see if taking the sugar pill has anything, will have an effect uh, also. Because that'll be like the baseline of the drug that you do. Okay. So that's a control treatment. Uh, we've also got other ways of trying to uh, control the experiment. Uh, we have blinding. So when we know what treatment was assigned, it's difficult not to let that knowledge influence our assessment of the response, even when we are trying to be careful of it. So what we will do is blinding. So in order to avoid the bias that might result from knowing what the treatment was assigned, we use this thing called blinding. Basically what blinding means is uh, participants, participants do not know what treatment they're in. Uh, and uh, a good example of this would be uh, if you're doing a blind taste test, right? Which soda do you like more, Coke or Pepsi? Well, 
they're if they're doing a good experiment to find out which one you truly like more, they should have a blank empty cup, and they should not. Uh, so there, so you should not know what kind of soda is in each cup. They are blinding you so they don't. You're not finding out which treatment is which. Is it the Coke or is it the Pepsi? Right. Um, if you're a MythBusters fan, there's a, a good myth out there where they're um, putting some people to see if yawning is contagious. They're putting some people in a treatment group where they yawn in front of them and then put them in a blank room. They're putting other people just straight into the blank room, and they're seeing if there is a difference between seating them with a yawn and not seating them with a yawn. And because they didn't know that they were being yawned at for on purpose, uh, they were blinded. They were blinded of that treatment. Okay. Uh, the best kind of uh, experiment is what's called a double blinding experiment, and that comes when we block. Or excuse me. We blind the two main classes of individuals who can affect the outcome of the experiment. So, if you're in an experiment, the people who can uh, influence it would be the subjects, so you're the person actually taking the treatment, right? Um, or you're evaluating the results of those. So the best kind of, uh, the best kind of experiment is going to be an experiment that blinds both of these groups. So the subjects don't know what they're getting, and the evaluators don't know which one's which. So you might put together an experiment where um, the evaluators uh, are just receiving uh, something with like a blue dot on it, and they're just writing the results of whatever that blue dot was, not knowing which treatment it was, so that uh, the people who are involved have no idea which one is which. Uh, so that, uh, and this is good because uh, it, it, it makes it so that anybody who, who could influence it uh, doesn't know which one's which. So uh, in both classes, if they're blinded, it's called a double-blind experiment. Uh, if only one of these two is blinded, it's called a single-blind experiment. And uh, double-blind is better because uh, it's going to reduce that bias as much as possible. However, uh, single-blind is good, uh, can be good as well. In general, you want to try and blind at least one of the groups uh, to make sure that uh, they're not influencing your results at all. Uh, placebos. Uh, a placebo is a treatment. Uh, sometimes just giving somebody a treatment can induce an improvement, uh, not even even if it didn't have any kind of results. Uh, so they call this the placebo effect, and uh, basically it means that you can take a fake treatment and you might get better anyway. My, uh, what I see all the time is a story from when I was a, a teenager, right? I went to a party as a teenager. And uh, the person who was hosting the party uh, wanted to serve beer to be co cool, but didn't actually want anybody drinking beer. So he served non-alcoholic beer, beer with no alcohol in it. And uh, people were drinking it, thinking that it was actually beer. And uh, so you had a bunch of teenagers who were acting drunk, despite the fact that they had no alcohol in their system. Uh, it was a placebo, right? It was a fake alcohol. So they they wanted to act like they were drinking, but they hadn't actually had any alcohol. Uh, but the fact that they thought it was was enough for them to change their behavior. Okay, so it was a fake treatment. A fake treatment is called a placebo, and this has uh, it's it's another way of blinding subjects, um, and it does have a legitimate effect uh, even outside of the realm of teenagers drinking non-alcoholic beer. Uh, there's drug tests where they, like I said earlier, they give you a sugar pill. Because sometimes just the act of taking a pill is going to make somebody feel better. Uh, because sometimes it's it, it's just in their heads, right? Uh, so sometimes just doing the placebo uh, will have a measurable effect. Um, and if it has like the same measurable effect as the treatment, well, then maybe the, the drug isn't doing a whole lot, right? So placebos are used uh, as an additional measure of blinding. Um, uh, so this is what I'm saying. Taking the the sham treatment uh, can take a response, have an effect. Uh, so it really does highlight the importance of effective blinding um, in in comparing treatments with a control, because 
uh, yeah, like I said, sometimes uh, you, you have this placebo effect where taking something results in a change even though uh, maybe, maybe you think it shouldn't, okay? Um, really, any time you can use a placebo for control, you absolutely should. It, it's an essential tool for blinding whenever we possibly can. Uh, all right, so the best experiments are randomized, comparative, uh, and double-blind, and com placebo controlled. If we can manage all of those things, uh, then we are usually creating a pretty good experiment. All right, okay, there's a couple more things. Blocking. Uh, sometimes groups of experimental units are similar, so it's a good idea to gather them together into what are called blocks. Uh, blocking isolates the variability due to the differences between the blocks so that we can see the differences due to the treatments more clearly. Um, when randomization occurs only within the blocks, we call the design a randomized block design. So to give you an example of this, uh, oftentimes in uh, drug trials or things on the, in, uh, the medical field, uh, they will block um, first by male and female uh, because our body chemistries are somewhat different uh, we can have results that might uh, work differently on a male versus a female so we block by male and female first so that the variability that would occur there uh, won't happen so uh, in terms of our experiment design we block by male female and then we serve the male the three treatments, so treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, and then we randomly assign the females to the three treatments, treatment one, treatment two, and treatment three. Um, and then we compare within the blocks. So we, uh, we're blocking because we want to uh, separate some of the variability that might occur uh, between two groups that are, are maybe known to have certain features in common. So we block them beforehand so that since we know that this variability exists, we don't want to have, like, if we were to do males and females together, we don't want to have more males than females in treatment one and more females than males in treatment two because that might be having an effect on uh, the overall um, gains, right? If males uh, are affected more by it than females, then treatment one might show different than treatment two. So we block by male-female first so that that variability isn't influencing our results. Okay, so that's called a randomized block design when we use it. We did talk about it as one of our four pillars. Uh, we use it anytime we have to use it, right? It's a really important thing to use. Uh, so here's uh, an example of um, that tomato experiment uh, done differently uh, with blocks, right? Uh, maybe we got these from block A, from store A, and these from block B, and from store B, right? Home Depot, block A, Lowe's, block B. And so we want to block them first because maybe they have differences in how they are, um, how they are done, like how they were grown, right? Uh, so then we do, again, we do the random assignment to the three control groups here, and then we do the random assignment to the three treatment groups here. Um, and then we compare them within their blocks, right? So there's a blocked experiment uh, in a retrospective or prospective study. Subjects are sometimes paired because they're similar um, in ways not under the study. So we call this matching. Uh, matching subjects, uh, subjects in this way can reduce variability in much the same way as blocking. Um, so we, and when we do this, this is called a, a matched pairs design. So uh, an example of the matched pairs would be uh, where I, uh, again, I'm doing something retrospective. Uh, I've got person A uh, who's going to be measured once uh, at five years old and at uh, 15 years old for something. Um, I'm matching person A's data from the five years to the 15 years. Um, so all of my data is going to be matched in this way, right? I'm going to have person B who's going to be measured here and here, and their data is going to be matched and compared. So instead of comparing groups together, I'm matching people to their specific uh, data from there, and we call that a matched pairs design. 
So we've got blocked, uh, randomized block design, a matched pairs design. Um, it's the same idea as stratifying for sampling. Uh, that's what blocking does. Both methods group, to, group, group together subjects that are similar and randomize within those groups as a way to remove unwanted variation. Uh, so we're just trying to reduce the amount of variability uh, that we can get. Uh, again, we use blocks to remove, re bleh, reduce variability so we can see the effects of the factors better. We don't want to see the effects of the blocks themselves. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about adding more factors. Sometimes it's important to include multiple factors in the same experiment in order to examine what happens when the factor levels are applied in different combinations. Uh, so, uh, for example, this diagram shows a study of the effects of different fertilizers with different water combinations on the juiciness and tastiness of the tomatoes. So here we've got 12 tomatoes, but notice that we've got six different treatments. Uh, because we have two factors here, the fertilizer and the water combinations. So for the, uh, we've got the six groups. Group one is uh, the control. So no fertilizer, no water, right? This is no, no. No fertilizer, that's what the control means. And no water. Then notice that we have half dose, no water, okay? So we're continuing this no water thing. And then we have full dose, no water. So I've got my three different levels, right? So tomato, the fertilizer has three levels. The water has two levels. So here we've got no fertilizer, but with water. Here we have half dose fertilizer with water. And here we have full dose fertilizer with water. Uh, notice that that results in six treatments. If you take the levels from each of your treatments and multiply them together, you will get the number of treatments that you need because you have to have every combination of every level. Notice that I have every combination of every level. Control no water, half dose no water, full dose no water, control water, half dose water, full dose water. Every combination of every level. So we can add as many factors as you want, as many levels as you want. It just creates more and more treatments. You don't want to go crazy and have lots and lots of treatments because then comparison gets hard. But Sometimes we do want to see which, uh, which of these two variables is having more of an effect. Uh, does the full dose fertilizer work as well with no water or as it does with, with water, right? That's going to have a significant difference of, in terms of, uh, how does the plant, how well does the plant grow, right? Uh, finally, let's talk about confounding variables. So when the levels of one factor are associated with the levels of another factor, we say that these two factors are confounded. Uh, when we have confounded factors, we can't separate the effects of one factor from the other factors. Um, and it makes it basically a useless, useless experiment. Okay, So to look at it in terms of this tomato one, um, if, now this is a big if, if having a half dose of fertilizer was in some way related to not having the water, we wouldn't know if it was the half dose of fertilizer that was causing it or if it was the no water that was causing it. So when these two levels relate in some way, uh, it, it means that the variables are confounded and we can't separate, separate out the effects. So we have to be careful in our design to make sure that this level is not affecting this level uh, so that we can separate the effects of the two. All right, and that's everything we've got for this video. That's the end of chapter 13. Again, uh, so we went through a lot of different topics with this one, right? It felt kind of maybe disjointed because there was a lot of uh, topics in here. If you've got a comment uh, or a question about any of those, please make sure you leave it here uh, or contact your teacher. Otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you for watching. Bye.